Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm joined by Elizabeth Hillman of Columbia University and a far ranging conversation which will include finding your niche. Physics helps you explain the world around you, which is very compelling. And then engineering is about problem solving. And so I tend, and then, you know, medicine is about helping people and seeing impact. And so sort of working in the middle of those is, is where I've sort of put myself. Potential benefit of scape microscopy. And I shouldn't say this, but like, this genuinely could replace Confold, right? With bags of advantages. Elizabeth's own favourite publication. It was like totally out there and it was a real struggle as well to get that, you know, published and then a real sort of delight to have a lot of people come and be like, oh my gosh, you know, you, how, where, where did you come from and how did you discover this? And why you should never, ever buy her seafood. I was vegetarian for 17 years until I had my babies and so, um, I don't like creepy seafoody things that have like creepy bits in them that like squish and crunch when you eat them. All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole and today I'm joined by Elizabeth Hillman from Columbia University. Elizabeth, hello. Hi. So, how long? That, that's not an American accent. Right. Well, <laughs> Not that an American accent yet. So when did you move to the States? Uh, 2001. Ooh, that, that's... Early, very early 2002. So 20, coming up 20 years ago. Yep. Uh, wow. I, I moved to York in early 2002 as well. So which Nowhere near the same change from Essex <laughs> to York. I did have the <laughs> option to go to America and thought actually... <clears throat> Was a much option. So, how has the move panned out? Um. Well, okay, I suppose. Um. I, I don't know. I. I <clears throat> sorry. I came over um, because I was offered a job at a startup company in Boston, and um, generally, so I was doing my PhD in London at UCL, and. Um, feeling a bit disgruntled with academia, feeling like we were doing this research, but were we really, you know, taking it out there and making it happen? And, and so I was at the SBIE uh, uh, <clears throat> Photonics West conference and a woman came up to me and gave me her business card and asked to fly me out to Boston for an interview. And it was all very exciting. So I went out and um, yeah, she offered me a job and it sounded really exciting. And so I sort of packed up my bags and, and went there and I brought two suitcases. One had one was filled with A4 paper, so I could print my thesis and mail it back. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I came over to work for a startup company. I promised my mom I wouldn't be gone for more than two years. And like you said, that was twenty years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah, I remember the same sort. Of, if I was going over, it was for a two-year burn and come back. Uh, yeah. But 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 York is always, I think, a longer-term goal for myself. So you moved, so what was the startup business in? It was a company doing non-invasive glucose monitoring using uh, uh, skin autofluorescence, which um, uh, my, uh, I had a professor um, at UCL, Dave Delpy, who was really amazing, like one of the people that really inspired me to, to get into medical physics and then biophotonics. And I remember him joking in our undergraduate class, that, like only crazy people tried to do non-invasive glucose. But um, back 20 years ago, people were investing in it like crazy. And um, so I, I thought, well, this will be a ch chance to go learn something completely new with a bunch of people who are really energetic and trying to make it work. Of course, 9-11 happened right then um, between me getting the offer, basically, and me starting. And so um, that changed everything. And then investment in the company went down. And it was it was a real roller coaster of of craziness so we all got laid off and um uh, you know but but it was an in i mean 
you know, I went in there saying, yeah, I know all about biophotonics, but actually I really didn't know all that much about fluorescent spectroscopy. I'd never really done animal work. I, I didn't know all that much about diabetes. And so the sort of, well, and FDA and, and commercialization stuff and startups. And, you know, so I was sort of like a learning robot just trying to scramble around pretending I knew all of this stuff until I actually did, you know, even MATLAB, like I was like, yeah, sure, I know MATLAB. And then all of a sudden, like had to just kind of hit the ground running and, and learn all of it. Um, and so it was an amazing experience. And I always tell my students, you know, if you want to try a startup, you definitely should. But what I learned mostly was that I really don't want to work at a startup. So I kind of went running from there back to doing a postdoc. And I was like, this is, this is this is what I need to be doing, right? I, I this is, but it but it gave me what I needed to then feel like I could navigate. You know, if I develop something as an academic that I then you know has has commercial potential, I then have this amazing network of people because you know when you all get laid off, you will go work for other companies, right? So I was able to do you know then sort of s s straddle both both the the the, um, the industry and the academia quite quite well based on the experience. So when it went when it went wrong, uh, the the policy after that, why won't you just pack up your bags, run back to the UK? You, you stayed out there. Yeah, I know. Well, so I I'd already so on my way out there, I'd been considering doing a postdoc at Mass General um, with David Boas, and so we'd been talking about that for a long time. And so when things started to go wrong. I wasn't in the good place to just sort of split and leave. So I went to him and we, so we'd already planned actually for me to go start a postdoc. I'd already submitted my application for my visa um, on the day we got laid off. So I, I felt like I kind of gamed the system pretty well there. Um, but yeah, so then it was a matter of like, I had to return to the UK and wait for my visa to get issued. And then I had to, you know, I came back. And I don't know, it was one of those acute situations sort of like I wanted to keep keep doing what I was doing, you know, in a way. So the, the thought of coming back and having nothing to come back to, you know, and not really knowing yeah, where think. in the UK I was going to live and where was I going to work and how was it, you know, like I'd got something set up. Um, this is not like me, but I'd also got myself a boyfriend who who worked at the company and who's now my husband. And so that was also sort of um, a grounding piece. A and, bit. An, an attraction to stay over there. Yeah. So. You mentioned you studied in London. So what, what was your subject? But what was your specialism? Physics. What's your it's specialism? Physics. And now, what's your specialism now? Well, um, technically, I'm a professor of biomedical engineering and radiology. Yeah. Um, I work in a neuroscience institute. And inside, I feel like I'm still a physicist. So um, I would say... Uh, you know, it, it, when I started doing physics, uh, and particularly around A-levels, when I was sort of trying to think about, you know, like, did I want to be a doctor? Or, you know, what did I want to do? I, I injured myself, I hurt my back, I hurt my knees, I'd had all sorts of different injuries. And I went to the hospital, went to physical therapy. And suddenly, I was like, who builds these machines, you know, and, and they were like, I think it's called medical physics. And I was like, oh, that, you know, the, the medicine mixed up with the math and the physics, where I don't have to actually like treat people who are bleeding because like that's just not going to work for me, but where I can like build things and like mesh together the sort of the biology and the and the and the physics, um, just kind of felt like where I wanted to go. So, um, so I think it's about physics helps you explain the world around you, which is very compelling, and then engineering is about problem solving. And so I tend, and then, you know, medicine is about helping people and seeing impact. And so sort of working in the middle of those is, is where I've sort of put myself. And, and can make big impacts. Uh, you're, you're not the first who said that, you know, you, you looked at it, you looked at medical careers or been a medic at some point because people want to help. But obviously if you're making the tools, the doctors can't work without them. Right. So, so it's, so yeah, it's, it's a really influential sort of role in society and science and, and probably has more impact maybe than any one individual can have if you can develop something new. And so where, where were you, I've got to ask, where, where were you brought up? Hitchin, 40 miles north of London, about. 
So my mum now lives in Nibworth. Okay, which is also near London. Right mm -hmm. So, and your family background all around London? Yep, yep. My dad was from Essex. Okay. Not a bad place. I wasn't brought up in Essex. I just there was it. there was actually a Hillman Undertakers in Walthamstow. That was the family business. Doesn't exist anymore. No, I, I, I've got to be careful of the jokes that I could put in for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've heard them all before, so I won't go that way. So when you went, so obviously the family's all very nucleated in that area. You went to the states. How often did you say you'd visit them when you left? Well, the, the company was very strange. One thing I'd never experienced, and that's very different in the US, is I, I had 10 days of vacation a year yep. with the company. And that horrified me. I, I didn't understand about holiday weekends, so nobody told me about that. So there's a multiple additional like Mondays off and stuff that they have throughout the year that crept up on me because I didn't know they were coming. But, you know, I was trying to do crazy things like go home for the weekend. You know, it's just ridiculous. Um, it's a little easier now. Um, so, so yeah, I would, generally we've gotten back at least once a year. Um, you know, now I have kids, it's, it's, it's harder to bring them back. But so we've tried to make sure that we see the family at least once a year. Um, it, it's weird because I would get invited to a lot of conferences, you know, where I would think, oh, I could stop in or, you know, I could kind of find a way, but it, it, it's not, it's not that simple. Um, no, and... Did you get to see much of the US itself in those first few years? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I am so happy in the last year and a half to not be traveling as much as I've been traveling. I mean, I got to the point where I was traveling every single week and actually it was miserable because you don't actually really get to see any of the US. You're just traveling around, sitting in airports and going out for a meal and then rushing home to see the kids. So, um, but yes, you know, I've, I've been all over. Um, yeah, it, it, <laughs> so if you've got 10 days holiday and you're only going out there for two years to start with, can I think, well, actually my, all my holiday is going to be spent coming back, visiting family, yeah. And, and then back to work again. So there actually isn't really much holiday because I guess when you go back to see family, it's quite intense because it's quite cramped it's, time. It's, it's true. But, you know, I'm also not I'm not very good at going on holiday. It doesn't you know, I know that's a British thing, but like I. I don't really switch off, you know, when, when I had my babies, I was holding group meeting while I was in labor and I, you know, within two weeks I was have my son sleeping on the couch in my office and I was back at work. I, you know, there's, there's, I mean, and I'm not saying everybody needs to do that at all. It's just that, I don't know. I, 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 my work is what I do. And, and, you know, you can't sort of, there you go. We just got a puppy. So, so, um, I, I've got to say, so that is a real life. I know puppy. everyone thinks it's a, it's a pet, but it's a toy, but no, it's an actual puppy. Yeah. So two children, Wally, Wally, Wally. Um, nine and eleven, and a very cute puppy, and a very cute puppy. The children are cute too, but <laughs> but the puppy is probably cuter. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah. So, so I don't know. Everything's always, um, yeah. So it's it's if you've got paper revisions due, or a student that's going to graduate, or you've got a grant you need to write, or a progress report, there's never really a break away from you know, that. So, so anytime we've tried, I mean, my honeymoon was just the worst, you know, because. <laughs> your husband might watch or listen to this. You do know that, don't you? Yeah, we agree on it. We agree on it because like, we got married the first se uh, the first semester I was at Columbia and I was teaching. So uh, I sort of taught my first class, went and got married, uh, came back. And then we had the honeymoon at Christmas um, in Hawaii. But you know, I, I still had grading to do. I, I was waiting on news of, of my first paper that was submitted to Nature Photonics. And, you know, I was checking my phone. It was back in the olden days, right, when you had a little Palm Pilot thing and you're like, it'll, the spinny wheel telling you you might have an email. And we're going around Hawaii. And both of us were just sort of like, you know, it was, this was not, this was not a time to switch off and relax and, you know, get away from it all. So, 
and and when I'm in that situation, I'm just more unhappy, you know. So so um, so to what, I, I don't know. We're getting into it, but what do you do to wind down then? What do we do? Don't you wind down? <laughs> good question. <laughs> no, my grandma used to say a change is as good as a rest, right? So I switch modes from you know getting up, you know getting the kids out of the door to school you know, then coming to work. So then work's different from that. And then when you finish work, you go home and, we, you know, cook dinner, spend some time with the kids and now the puppy and then the kids go to bed and then there's some more work and maybe watching a few television shows in the background. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's as much, you know, I say this to students that are writing their thesis, you know, you sort of, you spend some time on the figures and when you can't do the figures anymore, you spend some time on the text, right? It's, you don't necessarily need to sort of, do something enti entirely different. Um, well, I don't know. I, 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 it's not good, but I sort of draw satisfaction from getting things done. You know, it's quite satisfying, like cleaning the oven. You know, um, it's, it's sad, but um, yeah. Other ovens are hard work. Mm, I don't do it very often. Trust me. No, that that that's the problem. It's likewise, I, and the the amount of time you spend it sitting on the floor. <laughs> trying to clean it it's just like really once I've cleaned it I should just keep it clean it would be so much easier yeah yeah it's not clean anymore so I, I can't remember where I was going for the next question so thinking thinking back to work do you got me into ovens I'm thinking I still need to clean my oven I'm completely... <laughs> let's go do that now yes. wow <laughs> obviously one of the the big things currently that you've been involved with is with with scape uh, so swept, confocal, aligned, planar, excitation. How on earth did you think to come up with the name? The name? Yes. Well, that was fun, actually. So it was originally called LSIPT, uh, Laser Scanning Intersecting Plane Tomography. But it sounded like spit, and everyone was like, that's a terrible name. And so even when we submitted the paper originally, um, it was called LSIPT. And we were frantically trying to think of a new name for it before the paper came out. And we literally spent a whole day sitting in the lab. And I, I contacted a lot of people uh, that, that I knew that I respected, people I used to know from the, the company where I worked, you know, asking their advice for what, what to call it, you know. So um, and we came up with some, you know, rude acronyms and things and, and silly ones. And we almost did Solis, single objective light sheet. But that was the name of the and or software package. So yeah. that that didn't work. Um, and then, you know, scape seemed OK. It was kind of a play on scape scope. And um, it, around all the lab now, we've got every different pun you can possibly have. Like our computer's called goat for scapegoat and, you know, escape <laughs> and, you know, other other. So it's turned out to be quite a fun name to play with. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and it's, and it's and like it's, the head of an onion or so it's like the piece that comes out of an onion when an onion is growing so it's kind of an unusual word so if you google it you don't get a lot of hits um it's an important an acronym is actually quite important for the for the uptake because if it's easy to say and people remember it it gets talked about more and it gets more widely accepted in a yeah. way it, it, it's perverse you're a scientist and you have to be marketing as well oh yeah no, definitely, definitely. And, it, you know, <laughs> the other technology in the lab we didn't spend a lot of time on, we call it wide field optical mapping, which is WFOM. And it sounds awful. And everybody's really sort of frustrated with me that we have to call this thing WFOM. So, yeah, I, I was quite I was quite pleased with Scape. So for, for uh, and some of the viewers and listeners may not understand what this enables. Why is this different to other types of microscopy? And I, I think we've got, is this actually a Scape microscope? It is. It is. It's a, that's a nice one. That's that's Richard's one. He's very tidy. Um, <clears throat> right. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a weird one. I, I mean, as I maybe mentioned, um, my training originally was in diffuse optics, so it was not like microscopy at all. Um, it was using Thai sapphire lasers, but doing um, time dependent imaging through scattering tissues and doing finite element based inverse problems, re, in, in, inverse reconstruction algorithms to look at baby brains and breasts. Wow. And so I didn't come from 
classic sort of microscopy. So in, in the middle of that, so that got me interested in brain blood flow, which then got me interested in building two photon microscope to look at brain blood flow. So I learned how to build a two photon microscope. And then as we got more into thinking about the mechanisms that relate neural activity to blood flow in the brain, we wanted to go really fast in 3D. So I started to try to think of ways to, to extend two photon microscopy to high speed 3D imaging. And then got really annoyed that, you know, you're trying to scan this little point around and you can scan it faster and faster and faster. And all these papers were coming out in the early sort of noughties, the mid 2000s, you know, resonance scanners and AODs and all of this stuff, right? But, but they go faster and faster and faster. The instrumentation becomes more and more, you know, complicated. And then you just don't have any light and you're just burning holes in these, these animals. So, um, so we were just sort of like mulling around like what, what might we be able to do? And, and then uh, OPT came out, which was this optical projection tomography, which was, which was sort of caught my attention. Um, and, and I was like, oh, hang on, you sort of can use light like x-rays, you know? And so then I became more aware of light sheet. And, um, and then we just, we just had this weird idea. We had this polygon uh in the lab that we were trying to use to make a fast two photon and i was playing with it with the laser pointer going like i wonder if you could make a thing and it would scan like this and so we were just sort of fiddling around with it um and we came up with this geometry and it was a student who had a fellowship and so we were just playing with it and 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 uh he was modeling it and trying to convince ourselves that it was possible to basically create like a sheet illumination of light and have it sort of move um, and, and somehow stay focused on the move. So it was called intersecting plane tomography because we were sort of thinking of just creating a geometry sort of like this. Um, and then it really kind of evolved and it was originally for sort of meso imaging, we were gonna do like scattered light tomography with it. Um, and then one day we stuck a objective lens on there and we were like, oh, it's a microscope. Um, and, and, and so anyway, I, you didn't really ask me the history of it, but it's fun to to muse on it so it, it ended up uh that we generate an image by creating a oblique plane of light that comes out of an objective lens and then we actually image that light that's generated from that plane back through the same objective lens and so what you can do is then stick a camera back in the in the image plane uh, if you put the camera flat on, you get this kind of weird half focused image. But if you tilt the camera, or if you basically use two objective lenses to allow you to basically tilt the image, you can create an oblique focal plane at the sample. So you now have an oblique plane illuminating the tissue, kind of going into the tissue in Z and or Z, sorry. Um, and then you can you can focus on that plane and create a light sheet image through a single objective. So that that was the first part. And then we have this. Um, mirror in there, Galvo mirror, which allowed us to then move the sheet from side to side. But by actually putting the light that was coming back off that same mirror, we achieved the same thing as confocal scanning and descanning, where the image on the camera stays stationary while the plane at the sample moves from side to side, uh, while you still stay focused on it. And I, again, I'm just trying to express that sort of I don't know that it was happy accident. We'd done some other technologies a little bit similar to this that used this scanning descanning idea. So that was quite familiar to me, but um, you know, we just weren't really sure what we were doing um, with it initially. Um, but we started to get then, you know, these nice images. And um, what was really funny was my student was like, why are we doing this? You know, there's no samples that anyone's gonna want to image. Nobody wants to image anything that doesn't scatter quickly. And we were thinking, well, maybe we could do liquids flowing through channels or something like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, transgenic fruit flies and transgenic zebrafish suddenly just appeared. And all these little fluorescent critters just were suddenly available and the calcium imaging started to become available. And so we just had in our hands this imaging system that was capable of capturing these 3D images really quickly because the Galvo can just scan the sheet backwards and forwards and just grab the images. And, um, and everyone knows light sheet's super efficient and actually doesn't, um, uh, doesn't photo bleach very much. And so this sort of combination of just being able to 
capture the data really quickly, scanning the sheet from side to side in a 3D volume uh, without damaging the sample, we, we found that we could actually um, capture these, these really high speed 3D images and all these little samples that, that suddenly everybody had available, we could, we could capture them in 3D. So this is a color depth encoded image of a crawling uh, fruit fly larva. I think it's important for, for, yeah, so for someone who's not a specialist in high-end microscopy that yeah, we see this quite often, sort of images, they look glorious, but they're really difficult to acquire. And the, the big difference that you've made is the speed and the sensitivity, because obviously light, we all go sunbathing and it's not particularly good for our health. And when you shine quite an intense light on an organism, it's really not very good for a small thing. That's to right. have it detrimental to it and here you've got a technique where watching it live you can see what's going on in real time yes. and without it damaging the specimen I, I have got a few other images i, I think this one's yeah this Could one's explain a... what this image is okay um do you shall i let me do my uh there we go ah it is a psychedelic background, isn't it? See, if, you, if you're listening, you have to watch this moment. Because <laughs> Elizabeth- I might, I might have to turn it off before I drown in neurons. Um, well, no, so, so actually what I was gonna just say is that the, 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 the high-speed 3D imaging, I mean, there's some other benefits to it as well, which is that the, the lens itself is actually stationary, which is really weird. Everybody thinks you have to bounce an objective up and down or scan your object around to make a 3D image. But in our system, everything can be stationary, which is how come we could do like that crawling lava. Um, and and, and the, the other thing to say is it's actually really simple. So the mechanism and the instrumentation is really surprisingly simple and inexpensive compared to even a standard confocal. So, so that was one of the other things we loved about it. Um, this, this image is actually different. So this is a structural image that we collected on a um, expanded mouse spinal cord. And so this speaks to a quite a different uh, set of applications for this technology. So we got really in the beginning into sort of what can we image alive? What can we image moving and beating and flashing? Um, it was a little bit later that people were coming to us also asking for help with just high speed structural imaging. And um, I'm gonna turn it off before I get busy here. Um, so, uh, I hadn't even really realized as someone who hasn't ever really spent a great deal of time in microscopy course that these kinds of samples now that we can clear and expand take a really, really, really long time to image on standard point scanning confocals. And even when you can, they drift and they shift and they move and you have to stitch them together and it's a real nightmare. So. Um, with these, we just we just got some samples from different people, and we just imaged them by just you know using the sheet, and um, were able to collect you know really nice three um, D images. But most importantly, really quickly, um, and that allows us to to just increase throughput and and you know do things like multi color imaging. Um, so we're getting into that uh, a lot now as well. So I, I have one more image of, of, of the data sets because they are lovely, and I do think. This makes it look like a 1960s haircut mm. uh, flipping down. <laughs> and the movie for this, I, I think we can show the movie of this as well, I think, on the big screen. Uh, <clears throat> it, it's great. It, it, I, I just like the way this swims about. It's, it's a rather mm. cool image. But all these data sets that you've got here, now, were they all internal with internal collaborators or have you had to go or have people come externally from outside of Columbia to come and work with you? and to use this? So when the first paper came out, we must have had literally hundreds of emails from people asking um, all, the, all sorts of different things, but mostly wanting the system. Um, we kept track of all of them. We weren't really able to respond to all of them immediately because we ourselves were a little bit like, ah, you know, we need to figure out how to optimize this and get it working and, and work with it more before we kind of get people, you know, confused with it right but um in the end what happened was uh i'm fortunate at columbia there's a, a great huge number of people here who are who are really excellent who work in a lot of different model systems and in some cases you know they found us so we got the fruit fly lava collaborators quickly uh, uh fruit uh, adult fruit fruit fly brain um 
the the C. elegans worms, the um, the a, a lot of the samples sort of are fairly naturally occurring collaborations here within Columbia. And then there was a few extra ones that um, came to me, you know, from outside uh, that represented organisms that we didn't have here within Columbia. Surprisingly, the zebrafish grain is one of them. Um, and so, yeah, we sort of collected uh, different applications and worked closely with the people that were, you know, interested in imaging them. Um, and then on a wider scale, we've we've helped other people build systems. Um, we've had people come and collect pilot data. It it was a weird thing, let me say, because when I started my lab, I I was a little bit torn. I didn't want to just be a technology developer who sort of just develops technologies for other people. I'm a really firm believer that you have to understand the thing you're trying to measure in order to figure out how best to measure it. And so I've always wanted to know both things. And I mentioned briefly earlier that actually the field that we started out in was to look at blood flow in the brain and the way that it's regulated in relation to neural activity. And so I sort of pride myself on the fact that my lab both does technology development and uses that technology. And we've made our own biological discoveries in that area. But when Skate came along, I was like, I don't have the time and the bandwidth to become an expert in like epilepsy and zebrafish, as well as, you know, proprioception and fruit fly larva, right? So I had to really switch the mindset a little bit. And, and it really meant changing the lab and growing the lab in very different ways and finding kind of different types of people in the lab who really wanted to like work with collaborators and um, finding new ways to like teach collaborators as well to get them to um, work, uh, you know, to, to, to learn and to have a good sort of attitude about, about kind of taking on new technologies. Is this, is this your lab, the, the picture of your lab? That's a subset, yes. That's um, that's Creeper's thesis defense from a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's that's a post-COVID. That's about maybe half of them. Um, yeah, yeah, they're awesome. This has half, just a subset of the lab. How big yeah. is your lab? Because that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah. There's thirteen, I think. There. Yeah, twenty or so. Wow. Yeah. That's a, lot, that's a large lab. Yeah, it's too much. A little bit. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, no. But there, yeah, yeah. No, everybody, everybody does different things. Um, so to get, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah so to get the impact, uh, you said you help people build microscopes. I, I, I presume this is your lab and the lab actually playing and building. Yeah, that's pre-COVID. That makes me want to cry. That was, that was, that was before social distancing. This is a lot of your team actually working on. Building, actually working yeah. and using the microscopes yeah thank you grace sit lolly creeper and Wednesday. yep in the lab and that's sit lolly building a system uh out on the conference room table so she's she's a dab hand at building systems this is one that we built to take to dresden with us um well that actually could have been the cold spring harbor one we we, we went through a big phase in the middle where we were building them and putting them in the trunk of my Subaru and taking them out to different places and doing demos and, and helping people to, you know, get preliminary data and stuff. So she can build one in like, I don't know, I would say a week to be perfectly aligned. Um, she's, she's been amazing. She's actually, um, I tasked her when she came to the lab with documenting the systems, which is a little bit of a different thing than, you know, you would normally expect to have in a lab that's developing microscopes. And so, um, but that was getting crazy, right? I didn't have proper records of every lens that everybody had put into every system and how we aligned it and what we did and if we were going to share it. And that was why I paused a little bit on, on sharing things. I didn't want to just post part lists online. I wanted to make sure that if we were going to help people to build it, that, that they would understand the risk and, and they would actually get everything they needed to be successful in, in creating a system. So, so while he uh, documented everything, made these incredible like IKEA instructions, uh, we, we set up all the software really nicely. Um, she did, she's got the whole alignment procedure down um, and she coaches people via Zoom to align their microscopes all over the world. Um, you just scared me because you compared it to IKEA and I still can't put IKEA furniture together properly. There's always something left over at the end. I, it is a bit like that, I have to say, but you know, what else can you do, right? So 
to, to, to this, this just brings on to the next bit. It's great. You, you've obviously taken this on tour, showing people how it works. Showing pe- it's not selling it because actually people want to build it themselves. They need this capability. Universities around the world need this capability to enable their research. The only way to get it is to learn how to build one and how to operate it. And it's not easy to do that. So the other side, obviously, you've got IP wrapped up in this. And how much IP... You just developed something which, which I am aware is being commercialized to, uh, about, I, I, I presume this is common knowledge. Leica, I, Leica microsystems, yes. Yep. So Leica have this as a capability. You, you were in a startup, you are an academic, but this, this is now tying up IP, selling it to industry. How, how, how do you learn those skills? That can't, that's, I know, I guess everyone thinks there's going to be a lot of support in the university to do that. But ultimately, they're not specialists in the field. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it falls back, I guess, must have fallen back to yourself to do a lot of this legwork to, to do this. Yeah, yeah. So so I was fortunate in between. So, so as I was finishing my postdoc at Mass General, I actually developed another technique, which we call DICE, dynamic contrast imaging in mice. And that was my first sort of foray into it where I got this result. It was, it blew my mind. I was like, this feels very important, right? I convinced them to file a provisional patent, which they didn't want to do. But I had gone to a friend who, who I knew from the company where I'd worked and actually brought them the company ready to license it just to convince Mass General to file the provisional, right? Um, but I went through that uh, with the company. They did license it. Then we filed the full patent. Uh, they got an SBIR. They developed it, commercialized it. And so that's a technology which now is somehow part of like Perkin Elmer's small animal imaging system. So I had that experience. And so I'd been through it once before. And I knew that, you know, university uh, commercialization offices, you know, well, they're all different, but they tend to want to put some sort of a process in place that will sort of skim off and, you know, make the most of a lot of the inventions, but you're not necessarily going to be their biggest priority unless you kind of engage. And particularly, I'm afraid, a lot of these places have a tendency to want to um, go to the big famous people and ignore the junior female faculty who's asking you to file their patent sort of thing. So. Um, fortunately, I've been very lucky with the people that I've worked with here and found people who really were willing to work with me. And, and I found it to be a fascinating exercise. You know, it, it was it was just as much strategy and, you know, f- figuring out problem solving as as, as the rest of my life. So um, I, I, I kind of relished it, but I knew then very care- like. Uh, you know, for the longest time, Scape was sort of there in the lab. We were trying to publish a paper on it. We were sort of struggling to to get the paper uh, accepted because no one would take, no one would believe that it was new and different and actually work the way we said it worked. Um, the, the student that was working on it actually graduated pretty fed up with the whole thing. Um, and then I... I went in and I looked at the data and I made this movie of the crawling fruit fly larva. And I went to the Society for Neuroscience meeting and I went around to all the, all the vendors of the microscopes and I said, look at this movie. And I showed them this movie and they were all like, what is that? What, 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 what is that? What, who, who, whose work is that? Who, who, who is that? Do you, do you work with so-and-so? Do you work with this person? Do you work with that person? I said, no, I don't work with anyone. This is mine. What do you think? Sort of thing. And from there, like the, the level of excitement over it was just ridiculous. And so um and then this other really defining moment happened that winter which was a pipe burst in the lab and sprayed into the side of the system and completely destroyed it um and that was a catalyst for me to have to finish the paper because we just had the data we had on the surface (laughs) but that same week i got the the letter in the mail telling me the patent had issued and so it all just sort of came together. And, um, and then we just really started to shop it around to companies. And um, uh, yeah, it, it, it was, um, 
I, it basically took sabbatical to spend time kind of really trying to figure it all out. Um, and there will be people who go, oh, you know, this should be free. You should you shouldn't be commercializing it. I, I'm not of that opinion, but mm. you know, it'd be good to hear your reason. Why is it so important to actually get a company to adopt this and run with it? So the other thing to say that was going on in amidst all of this was I just had my second child and back surgery. Um, it was a crazy time. And when you're going through all of those things with all of that adversity, your brain sort of says, is it worth it? Like, is it worth doing this? Is it worth fighting for this? And I've had technologies I've been working on in the past where I've been like pretty glad to stop doing it, right? But every time I would come back and I would look at these images, every time I would sit down to use the system, I was like, this works. I don't even, we didn't even really understand why it worked in the beginning, but it worked. And, and every time we sort of got deeper into it, we were like, oh my gosh, it's good because of this. And it's good because of that. And like, there was this explosion in all of these types of GCAM, that calcium, uh, so the, these fluorescent indicators that could show you neural activity. And at the time, you know, every, Three months, a brighter one came out that suddenly we could image and people were falling over themselves like, please, 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 can I come to your lab? I need to get this data. So I was like, I've, you know, it's my responsibility to make sure that this gets out there. And it was hard because number one, I was completely unknown. The number of mansplaining conversations I had to put, go through with people like, you know, who are you again? Like, who do you work for? Are you a postdoc? You know, and, and, but I was like, galvanized by all this other stuff that was going on. I was like, I'm going to do it. I have to. And, 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 you know, the option of just putting it out there online and sharing it, you know, we had IP, we had interest from big companies. And, you know, I truly believe that in the hands of a big company that knows what they're doing, that can, that can refine the optics, that knows how to make this usable. Like, and I shouldn't say this, but like this genuinely could replace Confocal right? With bags of advantages, right? Like suddenly, you know, we're not bleaching everything. We're seeing things completely in 3D now instead of in two dimensions. So all of that drama goes away of like, oh, my, my sample's moving. I can't image it, right? And, and, and actually it's cheap. And, it's, it, you know, that was like one of the really important things is it's, it's simple. It's not one of these things that fills a room with like crazy multiple billions of different piezos and stages and requires three PhDs to run it. And so I was just sort of like, I wanted to try to get it into really good hands that could run with it. And I also knew I wasn't interested in doing my own startup, having been in one. And I had two small children and, you know, a, a lab and I was pre-tenure and you know, the last thing I needed was to be trying to get this off the ground, you know, by myself. And so, you know, I was absolutely thrilled when Leica came along and, and, and was interested in this. And um, it was a huge relief, you know, to feel that I had delivered it, you know, to people that could take it where I felt it could go. Um, and, and if you're going to do that kind of a, a deal, you know, you do have to be a bit careful about how much stuff you post on the web or, you know, hey, so, so we, we've been a little bit more cautious, but with the entire goal of trying to take this to the highest impact it possibly can have, right? And, and, and that, that, was, that was the goal. That's why I sacrificed so much. That's why we all went through so much to, to, to get it out there because we believed in it. I think, yeah, and, and, you know, there's advantages of startups, as we know, but the big companies, and there's a few of them out there, the big companies, they come, they've now got a difficult job to make it into a very robust, very user-friendly, fits in with their platforms, their designs. But that makes it even more user-friendly because it's more familiar to the user when they get the software package. The, the support, the engineer support. If anything goes wrong, as a biologist, you don't want to be going into there and realigning lasers or anything else, you need it to work out the box. And if it goes wrong, you need to be able to call an engineer. And yeah, going for the big companies, it will have the biggest impact, I think, ultimately. I think, I think another thing that people don't realize is that, you know, we as academics, we, we have a couple of microscopy cores in our universities, right? The, the microscopes that sort of your average academic uses is a tiny piece of the market in microscopy. 
right? There are pharmaceutical companies. There are places all over the world that use these microscopes all the time, right? And, th and they actually drive a lot of the market. And so, you know, and th those are the places where we might get new cures for diseases or new drugs for things or new understandings of, 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 of stuff that are really important and, and, and can have a big impact. And so, you know, we, we have tried to be, at least now we've gotten ourselves sort of organized as responsive as we can to anybody that's come to us from an academic lab, particularly if they say to me, I, the, I cannot do my work unless I have your technology. Right. If someone really comes and shows me that and we look at it and we go, oh, wow, our technology would really enable you to see a thing that you can't see right now. I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for that. Right. We will bend over backwards to try and get you a system in your lab and get you using it. Right. Um, but, you know, so we've, we've tried really hard to sort of fill in all of that sort of demand for the for the systems. But, you know, there's a very limited group of people that can build their own systems and who want to build their own systems and who can afford to take that risk and who can maintain them and actually get good images that 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 look like the ones that we managed to get. So, you know, it, it it's not to me, I mean, you can have a local sort of bubble of impact, I think, if you if you if you share things in that way. And like I said, we've actually we have done that. Um, but to really reach you know the the larger uh community um i i think i think we you know that's the hope uh, of what we'll achieve and, and the other thing i want to add is that you know this is such a sort of counterintuitive way to collect data it's such a weird geometry that has you know advantages and disadvantages um what, what's been really fun for us is to realize once we realized that and we weren't afraid of it, there was all these other things we can do with it now, right? So to push it further. And so it's not just, you know, I don't think that ultimately there'll just be like one skate microscope. I think there'll be a lot of kind of extensions and variations. Yeah, derivatives and adaptations. And, and move forward. And so um, the more people like know it's an option, you know, the, 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 the better from my perspective. I'm looking forward to seeing it when it's on the market. Me too. <laughs> and, uh, that that will be good. And you mentioned uh, the fact that you know, yeah. You know, who are you? Who do you work for? Do you think that was a? I've got to be careful how I word this. Do you think it was a male, female, or a, a gender bias, or do you think it was just that you were really young in that position? I wasn't young. I look young. I'm not young. Well, there you go. So, so was it an age perception more than a gender perception? Or do you think there's still a gender perception? Oh God, it's a gender perception, of course. Well, yeah, no, no, okay. It, it's not even that. I, I think about this stuff a lot. You know, even when it comes to things like just hiring people here in diversity, right? And hiring faculty and things like that, right? So, you know, in science, in, in these things, you're tasked with predicting the future, right? You're tasked with predicting success, right? And so oftentimes, you know, you, you, you want to hire a new faculty member and you've got a panel of, you know, older white men who are reviewing all of the applications. They're looking for themselves, right? They're looking for patterns of things they've seen before. You know, like, oh, I've seen a CEO that looks like this handsome guy here. So he would make, make a good CEO, right? Whereas I've never seen a CEO who is a black woman. So I'm not going to, you know, consider that in my, you know, equations, right? So, so um, I think it's just, you know, people are all about risk mitigation and they're all about like, have I seen this before? Does this match a pattern that makes sense to me, right? And, you know, arguably in microscopy, I mean, we've got Zhao Zhang, who's incredible, and, you know, Valentina Miliani, Naji. Um, I, I hate if I've missed someone off that list, but like that list is small. And I know because we're always the only like four people presenting the conferences, right? And so people can't pattern match that, right? The people like look at you and their brain is just going like, you know, does not compute. This must be a postdoc, and this must be someone who's worked for one of these famous, you know, men that wins Nobel prizes. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I don't think people. It's, it's I mean, it's called implicit bias, right? And and it can happen to guys too, because you know the other thing is, or well, what lab did you train in, or where did you come from, or what university are you at, or are you just an assistant professor, or you know, like 
you're always going to have people bringing these preconceived notions about you know whether they can believe you whether they can trust you whether they whether you're good you know um and and I mean, people get, you know, look at core facilities as well, right? Like there's always this power dynamic of, you know, I know better than you, or you know better than me. And like it's actually engendering environments where there's like mutual respect and, and you know, proper, um, you know, barriers get down and then you really get into it and you do good science together, right? It's it's everywhere. Um, so Tell I can't be getting better, being though. suspicious of me. Hmm? Things must be getting better. We have Kamala Harris, <laughs> Kamala. <laughs> I mean, things must be getting better. I don't know. I, Maybe another I, generation. You know, I, actually, you know, George, I maybe don't want to get into this, but George Floyd last year, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, um, in a time of pandemic when everybody has had time to think. I mean, I I have seen more of a move and a change than I had seen before. You know, um, lots of places are doing things on sort of diversity, equity, and inclusion here and now. And um, and there's always a danger with those things that they're superficial, you know, like, oh, well, I thought we were supposed to give the women extra points or something like that, you know? as opposed to genuinely like taking a moment and thinking like, what are my preconceived notions in this moment and how can I stop letting myself do that? So maybe a little bit. So it is a very different world to these times. So this is a picture you sent me, I I'm guessing you are- Five. Five and dressed as a- Flower fairy. A flower fairy. Yeah. And I was not happy about it. You were not happy about it. Look at my face. <laughs> I still do that face. My son does that face. <laughs> yeah. uh, but happier in this one. Now yeah, that one, we were on a bike ride. Yes. Yes. Uh, still age about five? And maybe a little bit older there. I don't know. I don't know. I was um I was a tomboy, I suppose. Not consciously, but um, yeah, they made me wear that tutu. And uh, my mom actually had to make it. I was actually really fascinated with how she made it. So that was really interesting. No, go um, back to, there you go. Yeah, yeah, she actually had to sew it. Um, and the little hat, she had to sew the hat as well. And then we were on stage for like five minutes or something. And my mom never let me hear the end of it. She was like, you know, I had spent hours on that thing. And then you were on stage for five minutes. Um, but yeah. This is parent then. And this was my dad insisting on taking pictures of me out in the garden. We got lots of pictures. He was a, really into photography. So uh, um, there's lots of <laughs> very reluctant photographs. <laughs> It is a super cool fed up face. So go on, yeah. I've got to ask, now we've just seen this as a, as a flower fairy. What did you want to be? What, did you, what, what was your first, as you were growing up, what was the first job you thought you'd like to do as you were growing up? I used to tell people, um, an artist or a comedian? Now I know about comedians, I would say no, but um, um, I liked art, I liked making things. I liked building things, creating things. I don't suppose I even really knew what an engineer was, but um, I laid a lot of concrete with my dad and um, we did a lot of home improvement stuff. Uh, and that was just very natural. That's sort of just what we did. That was sort of what we did as a family. Um, your family's business was an undertaker's and you oh, laid no, lots like of concrete. Was, was this a legal back. business? <laughs> my, my dad was an aeronautical engineer with a penchant for half finished home improvement projects. So, um, and my mum was a French teacher um, and that sort of explains why I'm a mess. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, so I did, I, I, I just always, I, my mantra for choosing what I wanted to do was just, just trying to just do the things I enjoyed, you know, the things I was good at and I enjoyed. And of course you enjoy the things you're good at. So um, 
And I would say one thing, I went to an all girls school. My mom was the teacher at the all, all girls school. That was, oh gosh, I'm such a mess. But from 11 through 18, I was at a girls school. Um, and a, a comprehensive, not fancy posh one. But uh, I would say, I really thank them for making it feel very normal that my favorite subjects were technology, art, science, and math and physics. Um, and I never felt, not until I was about 18, you know, that that wasn't what I was supposed to love doing. Um, my sister did a chemistry PhD ahead of me. So she, she uh, sort of already gone in that direction. And so um, I just kept doing the things I like doing. And, um, and then, like I said, I had that moment when I got so injured through that I did a lot of gymnastics in the end. So gymnastics was a much better fit for me than, than, than ballet. I fortunately was allowed to stop ballet. Um, gymnastics was great because it's physics and it's challenging and you can you know, push yourself, but then you injure yourself. So then you get end up in the hospital and you learn about medical physics. Um, and I was into space as well. So I was like torn between doing like space science. And so uh, if you could do any job in the world now, what would you be? That's really cruel. <laughs> I mean, cause you know, I, I would say I, by nature of what I just said, it would be the job I have because if I could think of one I'd like to do more, I'd probably go try to do it. Um, but I don't, there's lots of pieces of what I do I don't like, especially, you know, just the stress, the drama of it. Um, but, and sometimes I'm super jealous of the people that just, you know, have a nine to five job, you know, but- you the sense of reward in those jobs? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like, so, so my mom, you know, ended up taking early retirement. She'd got remarried, and uh, you know, her new husband was like, "Oh, you, your, your job is so stressful for you. You should take early retirement." She's like, "Yes, I'm going to take early retirement. I'm going to live this wonderful life." And within, you know, a month, she was head of the local chapter of this, and she was teaching French to the people at the old folks' home, and she was in charge of this and in charge of that, and you know. She, she can't sit still, she couldn't, she couldn't function. There was no amount of poodling around in the garden that was gonna keep her happy. Yeah, and it's a nine to five obligation, but ultimately it's nice to, yeah, I don't know. There's gotta be pros and cons to both, haven't there? I, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I think it comes down to like, where do you get your dopamine? Where do you get yeah. your little feelings of satisfaction uh, that you're that you're doing something um uh, for me it's like you have to feel you're doing something worthwhile right so I get from the kids and and now the puppy and, and my students and 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 my work and you know okay so let, let's switch the conversation a bit what's your favorite what's what is your favorite item that you own That's a hard one. My scooter. Aha. Uh -huh. Which you use to go to work and keep up with the kids and uh, <clears throat> electric scooter. Something else important that I should have thought of. Mm? Electric scooter. Oh or... no, 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 no. You're, you're a traditional scooter. Yes. I had an electric one for a while, but it was really dangerous and really expensive and really horrible. And it broke and they let me send it back for a full refund and I was very happy. And I went back to my regular kick one. Okay. What's your pet hate? Don't say podcasts. I don't like podcasts. Um, I really hate it when people tell me I'm going to get things and then I don't get them. Across the board. Oh, um, I'll some examples, but I won't. Because that, that no. could... That could go okay that's just the first thing that comes to mind and i again you're, you're challenging me here because i want to say something yeah but but that's one of the things that really annoys me that's a really good answer though okay what's your favorite food cheese Ooh. any particular type just good old strong cheddar 
Sounds good. What, what food do you most hate then? It's hard to think of it because I avoid it. I don't like, um, I was vegetarian for 17 years until I had my babies. And so um, I don't like creepy seafoody things that have like creepy bits in them that like squish and crunch when you eat them, like clams and mussels. And it, it just seemed totally unnecessary to me. I can't understand why people eat those. Do you ever dread it when you get taken out on a, if you're a guest speaker and you get taken out for a meal and it's a set course and you're thinking- I ate an oyster with the chief scientific officer of Leica once on, uh, you know, but yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's never that, again. Yeah, please don't make that food. And it's like, oh no, how are you gonna, I've got to eat that now. <laughs> it, it's actually, don't tell anyone, but it's my mother-in-law that did that to me. That was the worst because she would cook me vegetarian food and then vast amounts of it. And she'd be like, well, I haven't tasted it. How does it taste? And I'd be there going like, oh, you know, <laughs> I hope she doesn't see this, but that was well, well-meaning people cooking you vegetarian things as a vegetarian, really, because it breaks your heart, right? Because you definitely, you don't want to tell them that you don't yeah, like it or you don't it, want yes. to leave it. And it's a British thing to always finish your plate, right? Like you always eat everything that's on your plate. You never, ever leave anything. And apart from in a restaurant now here where you can take it home with you. But um, but yeah, so so that's my worst nightmare is when someone actually really well-meaning tries to cook something really nice for me. Um, and when you're vegetarian, it's you're, the spotlight is on you because there's like one thing you can eat, right? If you're not, you can pick around. Uh, but yeah, that's hard. And usually generally fairly homogenized when it's delivered as well. <laughs> so, so it's not much playing around, is so. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go on, what's your favorite movie? God. Sound of Music. Oh, classic. I've rewatched that so many times, and I would associate with each character one by one, going all the way through from the little girl to the teenager to Maria and Captain Von Trapp. And we watched it Thanksgiving and my whole family were just charging around singing all the songs. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, right in the middle of right in the middle of the election and all of the craziness that was happening there. And even then there was like shades of that, you know, with the, with the part at the end with the, with the flags and the, yes. yeah. Classic. TV or book? Sorry? TV or book? TV. TV? Do you have a secret trash TV program you watch? Um, there's a show here called The Resident on Fox, which is like a really, it's like ER, but like much worse, you know, like medical drama, uh, not drama, like I, I'm a sucker for those like hospital, hospital, uh, you know, casualty in England. Yeah, and yeah, you don't I, get I, it here. I was gonna say, I went to my wife, she loves Holby. But, yeah. yeah, which is a yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I guess that answers that, John. Are you a night owl or an early bird? Night. Okay. What's your preference, UK or US? Well, that's. Am I allowed to elaborate? I have yeah, been. Because either you're going to lose your UK passport or you're going to lose your job, one way or the other. So you can't win. I got. I got both. Um, so. There's reasons why I left the UK to come here. There's things about the UK I love. Oftentimes I'll say to my mom, you know, well, it's not like that in England. And she's like, well, it actually is like that in England now. So I feel very out of touch with what England is actually like now. Um, and I know what America is like now. And there's a lot of bits of that I don't like. The last four years particularly was dreadful, five years. Um, and so it's it's weird what I actually say, and I get a lot of resonance on this when I talk to other people who have sort of come here from other places, is that when you when you belong one place and you come to another, then you never really belong in either. Um, and so I feel that way, but in a way, um, I kind of like it like that. So the case in point is like our wedding. We just pretended that, you know, um, this is how you do it in England, right? To all the Americans. And we pretended to all the Americans, this is, you know. The, or, yeah, or, and vice versa. 
and and so we sort of got away with just sort of being in ourselves right and and i feel a little bit like that i think you get forgiven a little bit for your idiosyncrasies if you're in a different culture and you can blame it on your other culture and i've sort of found myself hovering above both so i think definitely some things about britain i love british people you know oh, they just say it and they get it done and i'm not very good at the whole hi how are you like thing here um but yeah i don't know it's too long question i like that so it could be even more quirky if we go abroad that's mm -hmm. quite a big incentive mm -hmm. <laughs> who you really want to be instead of who you're meant to be seen as exactly uh because it's that's definitely that perception uh, <clears throat> moving back i've got to ask uh, i i forgot to ask earlier what is your favorite publication that you authored or co-authored successful not successful what is your favorite one. publication none of them are my favorite because every single one is like giving birth and it's painful and traumatic i mean actually no giving birth was wonderful because they got wonderful children out of it but yes, i find that the, 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 I I the publication right? process incredibly challenging to navigate every single paper um so i've already talked about scape so i won't say that one uh we we did a paper on the vascular endothelium in the brain uh and um it's it's out there and um it was very hard to get it published for all the same reasons as my other stuff, which is that I was completely unknown in that field as well. And I had to bust into it and get people to trust me. It's just what I do, I think. I'm just drawn to doing that. Um, but, but I would say that that one as well as we built this imaging system and we saw something and we had to figure out what it was that we were seeing. And so we had to teach ourselves the biology. And so we, 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 we demonstrated that um, when blood flow changes in the brain, a critical part of it is the lining of the blood vessels themselves, which propagate the signals to dilate. And we we showed that if we damaged that, they didn't do it. And it was it's important because if you look at any of the work prior to that, nobody labeled the endothelium of the vessels in any of their diagrams. Uh, it was like there's this cool picture of like the rest of the world from Manhattan, where it's like New York, New Jersey, and then the rest of the world. It was like everything was just the vessels were just ignored and yet when we really dug into it we were like it explains so many things it explains all the stuff that people people have missed um and and it and it provides like a link between say cardiovascular disease and brain disease that you know otherwise was sort of very vague um and so it was like totally out there and it was a real struggle as well to get that you know, published and then a real sort of delight to have a lot of people come and be like, oh my gosh, you know, you, how, where, where did you come from and how did you discover this? And, but it's, it's taken, it's, it's guided a lot of research now moving forward. And now people put the endothelium in their diagrams mostly, which feels pretty satisfying for physicists. And I, 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 I realized we've actually just run over the hour. So I apologize for running on a bit, but I've got to ask you, what do you think is the next big development? What's the next big challenge? In what sense? Uh, Ever? Either in microscopy or for your science or just in science in general. Where is, where, where, what needs to be solved? What needs to be developed, engineered? Um, so I think it's data and analysis and coding and I'm, we just, we just started a project where we're going to try to image every single cell in the human brain. And, um, you know, we can generate that data now, right? We're, everyone's super interested in multiplexing, like, you know, every hundreds of cell types, right? Like proteomics, like in, in you know, in situ sequencing, all of this, right? We can generate so much data now and everyone's like really like hungry for it right but it's there's still this divide now between the analysis of that data and the acquisition of that data and you know i've always been positioning myself like we need to be like the biologists and the images need to be really in sync and know understand each other and know what's happening here so we don't accidentally image the wrong thing and vice versa but the analysis is so crucial and you know even for our stuff you know it it 
it's the it's the iceberg, right? The imaging and the, the experiment is here. And then all of the analysis is underneath, right? To really turn those pretty movies that we had into actual quantitative hypothesis, hypothesis proving conclusions. And it, it's such a void. I mean, we're not teaching biologists and experimentalists how to code and how to how to be confident with analysis. We've got machine learning, which is this like fool's gold at some point, right? Where like in the right hands with the right question, it can really save you a lot of time and do a lot of amazing things. But I'm really fearful that in the wrong hands, it's going to just cause a huge mess and people are going to learn things very superficially. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I, and the data scientists are amazing, but they don't right now receive the kind of training that they need to have in both how the images are generated so they can understand, you know, what the foibles of the imaging are going to be and what the biological question that they're trying to address is. So um, I've I'm I'm always been a hoarder when it comes to everything, but also data. And we've got tons of it, but um, I'm fearful. Tera uh, or peta, terabytes, petabytes of data? Peta, peta. Petabytes, just to give people an idea as to how big these data sets are. It, it's right, right now I have about one petabyte, but um, when we start this human brain thing, it's going to be a petabyte per brain. Which, which is huge. And, and interesting talking to Jeff Lickman, who's doing the, the, the EM side. Right, right. A different scale, but also a different size of brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying Jeff's got a different brain. Or maybe, <laughs> I like Jeff's brain. The, the mouse brain rather than the, the human brain. And it's, it, the challenges are huge. And actually, yeah. this is where people may in future get involved. So talk to Chris Lintot and Zooniverse, just how that can help science move forward and it needs lots of volunteers to help yeah. because computers can't do it yet but they, they, there needs to be this bi-directional communication education you know interaction and respect mutual respect i mean I, again i i always said that having divorced parents was a great exercise for for interdisciplinary science right my phd was 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 literally one experimental group over here and the theory group over there and i was the one in the middle being like no 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 he didn't mean that he meant this and like trying to translate between the two and jumping in and being willing to say no this is something we have to fix on the analysis side this is something we have to fix on the experiment side and and learning all the biology and being like by the way breasts don't have that in them so we shouldn't try to solve for that you know and 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 so I I've always positioned myself in those sort of blue positions like b between everything, but I have a limit in how my expertise, right? But so often there's this tendency to just want to lob the data over, you know, the data sharing. I know no one's ever allowed to say anything against data sharing, but this mindset of sort of just post it on the cloud and someone's going to come along and just, you know, analyze it for you. I mean, that that's um, terrifying. Um, yeah, and, and to be fair, to make sense of it, it needs the person who generates the data to drive that and still be author of it and take a direction. Elizabeth, we, we, we spoke way over. I'm really sorry. Uh, you can cut I, all, all that rubbish I have, earlier. I have got to ask you one more question. I, I, I don't ask this of everyone, but I've got to. You said at one point you, you dreamed of being an artist or a comedian. Do you have a favourite joke? Yes. Go on. What's orange and sounds like a parrot? Go on, what's orange and sounds like a parrot? A carrot. Oh, <laughs> you've got young children. I know, oh, that, that, that joke never <laughs> fails. <laughs> Love it. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for everyone who's actually watched or listened to this. It's been, hopefully you found it really inspiring and entertaining, especially on that last note. <laughs> it's brilliant. But Elizabeth, thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.